Within the heart of the South East is the home to Young Startup Talent, an initiative that has been helping young entrepreneurs across the region for the past decade, since 2010. The project has worked with and inspired hundreds of 16 to 25 year olds to have a can-do attitude and provide help and support for them to start their first business. The team at Young Startup Talent has been searching the area to find the most feasible ideas to compete for the 2020 prize fund. The area has once again revealed a wealth of entrepreneurial young talent to draw from. Welcome to the final of Young Startup Talent 2020. Every year a set of young entrepreneurs submit their business concepts to see if they have what it takes to win over the local business community and be in with a chance to walk away with the Young Startup Talent Prize Fund that is donated by local and national leading businesses. This year, the team gathered to find the young business talent from within the area in a bid to whittle the finest entrepreneurs down to its very best. With a successful track record of past young startup talent winners and finalists rapidly flourishing among the business world across the area since its inception 10 years ago and spreading the word of young startup talent, many young entrepreneurs submitted an application to the team. Only those that show they have what it takes, know their businesses inside out and can face the judges under pressure have succeeded to the final stages. After visiting schools, colleges and universities within the area, the successful applicants attended the Young Startup Talent Workshop at the NatWest Accelerator Hub in Brighton and speed networking event at Base Point Business Centre in Crawley. The evening was set to put the young entrepreneurs, all aged between 16 to 25, through their paces. In attendance were judges, sponsors and supporters from the local area who were keen to see the range of ideas submitted by this year's Young Entrepreneurs. Following on from the speed networking, the finalists were selected and are about to pitch in front of our judges at the offices of Talis UK in Manor Royal. Making up the panel for 2020 includes Lorraine Nugent, Managing Director, Young Startup Talent and PR Specialist at Wildwood PR. As well as being one of the founding partners for Young Startup Talent with a passion for business and helping young entrepreneurs to grow and develop, Lorraine also is a PR Specialist at leading PR agency Wildwood PR. Matt Turner, CEO, Creative Pod Group. Matt is not only one of the co-founders of Young Startup Talent, but also CEO of his own group of companies, The Creative Group. John O'Mahony, Practice Lead, Gatwick and Audit Partner, Grant Thornton, UK LLP. John is an experienced partner and tax advisor based in the Gatwick office, with more than 20 years experience of working with a wide range of clients from listed corporates and their stakeholders. John Redfern, Director of Corporate and Commercial Banking, South East Region, NatWest. John has worked in financial services for 25 years. He qualified as a Chartered Accountant in London with PwC before moving to NatWest Bank. Anna Christie, CEO, Sussex Chamber of Commerce. Anna has substantial business experience, both in the UK and internationally. Anna's career began in aviation at both Gatwick and Heathrow airports before progressing into hospitality in London. David Kickham, Deputy VP, Industrial Operations, Talis UK. Dave Kickham joined Talis in 1986 as a software engineer and focused on ground-based and airborne radar and electronic warfare systems. He then led teams in quality, program management and business improvements. Mario Corozo, CEO, Caridon Property. Mario is a highly respected property entrepreneur who acquired and developed his first property at just 18 years old and has since used this experience to expand his skills in planning, construction and housing. Zach Lloyd, Deliver Me. Deliver Me is a revolutionary on-demand app that connects people to independent delivery contractors. The app will act as the user's personal shopper, instructing our self-employed contractors to shop, pick up, or drop off items for them. It's an on-demand delivery and pickup platform. 
Deliver Me has no limitations when it comes to delivery. Good evening everyone, I'm Zach, I'm the founder of Deliver Me. It's an on-demand delivery platform where it connects independent contractors to our consumers that want anything, anytime, anywhere without the restri restrictions. Have you ever ordered something online and wish you could get it immediately? Or that you weren't just limited to the stores that were available to deliver from? There's a gap in the market for an on-demand delivery platform that allows you to order anything, anytime, anywhere <coughs> without the restrictions. We're in the midst of an on-demand era where, as we all know, technology has helped us make instant delivery possible. And we are now at the stage where we have a beta application produced. Um, we're about 90% done from the finished product, launching first in Birmingham, and then nationally roll out over a three-year period. Um, we have conducted some market research with a few small uni students. Um, we tested the idea out with them. We've tested actually if the service actually works and within our estimated timeframes of 30 to 40 minutes per delivery. So where the application works is we have two iOS and Android apps, so one for the delivery partner and one for the consumer. And we also have an admin panel where we manage everything from operations to manually adding stores and updating stock lists and price lists. Um, so the user, use the app, when they open up the application, within a two mile radius, they'll see stores and takeaways that are near to them. They're already predefined by us and the stock list is updated regularly within the 24 hour period. The user then places an order through the app. They are charged a service fee and a delivery fee. And then that order is passed on to the nearest delivery contractor within that two mile radius. Sounds like you're trying to be Deliveroo or Uber. Is it Uber Eats? Is, is it, tell me how it's different to those two things, which are clearly well established. Yeah, working. sure. Um, it is very similar on the way how the app functions. And um, the only main difference is they need to have a partnership with the actual store itself and charge heavy fees to actually get software in the store. Um, the difference with us is we don't have any partnership with the store. It's literally directly from the consumer to the delivery partner. We have no connection with the store at all. How do you know what stock they've got? Because unless you've got the same software, how are you going to check if the, you know, the, the corner shop's got the same stock that that person needs if you're not connected to the same software? Yes, yeah, so um, most of the generic items that everyone needs, we already have data on that. Um, all the big stores like Asda, Tesco, Waitrose already have online APIs available for us to manually pull the data and update it automatically without us having to put a manual import in. Um, the corner shops, uh, most of the corner shops are take cash only, which we can't support. We can only support stores that can take online payments. Your, your reputation is going to be very much around um, your line on the yes. performance of the delivery organization. Delivery how are you going to assure that? How are you going to check that? How do you ensure that your delivery partner is... So um, we'll have someone as an operation director who will monitor all the drivers. All the drivers are tracked through our app. So we know where the location is, how long it takes for them to place an order and deliver an order. And we frequently update, or train them and update them on ways they can improve on or what's lacking. I'm at home, bored. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm bottle of champagne, what happens? So you, if you want to bottle of some champagne, um, you open up the app and you'll see predefined self category. So you would click on alcohol delivery. Okay. And based on popular products okay. selling within that week, you'll yeah. see the top champagnes okay. that were selling. And you're going to charge me how much more for that champagne to deliver to me in 30 minutes? It, it will be the recommended retail price. We do not add a markup fee on the actual products themselves. The delivery. But the delivery fee, yeah. Um, around, if it's within a two mile radius, the minimum would be for just one bottle of yeah. champagne would be 349. A bit more if it was at a peak time. Yeah, so we do have surge pricing. So we, when to intensify um, delivery contractors and to also encourage people to not order at this time, um, we do have a surge pricing fee of one to three percent increase in delivery fee. Need to drink your champagne in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> What's your estimated number of deliveries in the first month? The first month is 150, I believe. I've left it down below on the average orders per month that okay. we aim to receive. They're very conservative numbers. I personally stick to luxury brands if I was you, because yeah. I think the concept's good, That's but I don't think it can work at that level. You know, 30 yeah. minutes, even of if course. I left my home quickly and rushed to the supermarket now, I'm but it's a struggle to get there and back in 30 minutes, let alone finding a driver that's mm -hmm. on the road. If you go for a lux something luxury, I might say, look, I want to spend 20 pounds on a bottle of champagne. I'll take, I'm happy to spend five pounds, even 10 pounds to get it because it's convenient. And that's probably more realistic 
then trying to do that. Anthony Meller, White to Label. White to Label Manufacturing specialises in both white label and bespoke product services for sportswear brands. Utilising extensive supply chain management, they're able to offer a comprehensive bespoke service for businesses looking to produce custom garments for their brand, as well as offering low MOQs and faster turnaround times through a white label service, which is tailored to help startups get their brand off the ground. Hi everybody, you all know me already, so I won't, I won't bore with the introduction. The global sportswear market is estimated to be worth in excess of $200 billion by 2024. Now one thing that's certain is that all sportswear brands require a manufacturer of some sort to produce their garments. However, a lack of online presence and high minimum order quantities mean that, means that most startups are left with a relatively unviable option for production. Y2 Label Manufacturing is a sportswear manufacturing company based in the UK that specialises in the creation of both bespoke and white label product services for brands. This allows them not only access to lower minimum order quantities, but a streamlined production service, which therefore reduces their risk of overstocking from the get-go. The business was founded um, in, towards the end of 2018. Um, I originally started my business career you would, um, at the age of 18 when starting my own independent sportswear brand. Through building that business, I learned how to manufacture, how to source manufacturers, how to design, and all the bits and bobs that come along with that. Whilst I was running that business, I saw a gap in the market. I was sending thousands of pounds to people I've never met in countries I've never been to, um, and I was, per I was deliberately buying too much stock. I knew I couldn't sell it, but I had to hit the minimum order requirement with whatever factory I was working with. So I thought, there must be an easier way of doing this. I decided to launch a minimum viable product, and from November of 2018, we started selling our first service, which is a bespoke service to clients. Since November of 2018 until January of 2020, We've successfully sold £54,300 in sales um, at a 35% gross profit margin and a 19% net profit margin. In April of 2019, the business became my full-time job and I now run that full-time. Um, so we've grown quite well since then. Um, why am I here today? I'm here today because I'm looking to grow the business. I'm looking to scale. Um, part of that includes potentially moving over into North America and opening up a little hub to test the market but I need PR, I need branding assistance in order to appeal to the market out there. In addition to that, I would like help and assistance in terms of financials because one of the plans that I intend on implementing over the next 12 months is to bring our customization in-house. A lot of your um, products you purchase from China. Yes. Now, because of the current situation with coronavirus, mm -hmm. how has that impacted your business because of um, supply chain and import and export of goods has, has been hampered. It has it's affected us um, in terms of our bespoke service. However, what I've begun to do over the past two weeks as the situation has developed is market our white label service. So I've begun to market two brands who manufacture in China, whose supply chain is now affected. We have 26 blank garments here that we can stock and we can brand for you here in the UK. So you don't have to have inconsistent stock levels. You don't have to have you know, loss of revenue because you don't have any stock. These products are in line in terms of quality and the aesthetic look and feel as what you would have manufactured in China anyway. So we've started to implement a marketing campaign towards appealing to brands. But yes, it has affected us in some aspects, but we're trying to, to manage that. So if I had a big order coming to you now, you wouldn't have no problems? No. And in addition to that, we also have manufacturers elsewhere as well, so we don't have to work with China. We have Portugal. the same margins, but... Same margin, just high minimum order quantity. So we're not limited in, in what we can do, we're just limited in what the client's budget or time restraints are. You, you talk about bringing printing in-house. Mm -hmm. um, what's the thinking behind that? Because surely it's cheaper uh, outside the UK. In terms of um, no, so that would be for the white label service. So with Bespoke, when we manufacture it overseas, the whole product is made custom, it's tailor-made for the client. The printing and embroidery and all that stuff is just included in the price. What we do for white labeling is we, stank, we stock and store blank products here and then we customize them in the UK. So at the moment it works great because we're getting, we've got quite a good deal with local printers, local you know, customization units where we work on like a quarterly rebate fee if we hit a certain amount of sales and, or bring in a certain amount of revenue for them. However, in the long term, it would be more cost effective for us to lay out the initial investment into a printing machine as well as offering that service at a quicker time and lower unit cost for us, bringing an extra revenue stream to be able to offer printing services on demand for other potential clients. Uh, congratulations on you know, just 
getting it going and trading yeah, thank and you, making thank you. decent margins so Appreciate early. Appreciate that, thank you. Um, can I just ask, I think you mentioned you've done 29 projects already for mm -hmm. £1,900 each. And yeah. Have you had any repeat business yet? A lot. Have... We've had three orders from the same client already this year alone. Um, so repeat business has been good. I tend to work on the notion that I think worst case scenario, so I'm constantly looking for new clients, but my main priority is my clients I have right now. So I invest a lot of time and attention into the people I work with currently in the hope that that will pay dividends in the long run. And it has so far. Um, as far as I'm aware, none of the clients that I've worked with have gone elsewhere. If they haven't purchased again, it's just been a sake of they've not been able to shift the stock they currently have or they're putting their money elsewhere. And what, what drives them to repeat purchases? Is it, are there sports clubs that change the year on their shirt every year or what, what sort of things? It tends to be drive? brands that want to go along with seasons. So a lot of brands will you know, release collections as the season goes along, <coughs> different styles. So in the winter they're going to work with hoodies, jackets, whereas okay. in the, you know, the summer they're going to work with shorts, vests, those sorts of things. So it's a seasonal thing as well as a restock as well of stock they currently have. Carmel Kalani, Spice Up Your Life. Spice Up Your Life empowers consumers to engage with international organic spice farmers as if they were locals, through an app, which further solves the issue of young people's struggles to make quick, delicious, nutritious food with the algorithms that cater for personal recipes. Customers will learn how to informatively use spices while consciously contributing to improving the livelihoods of the spice farmers. Uninformed consumerism has an oppressive impact, oppressive impact on the economic freedom and social mobility of spice farmers around the world. Unjust trade is to the benefit of the consumer, but to the detriment of the farmers themselves. Furthermore, so-called organic fair trade products, working with international spice farmers, is costly and deceitful to small-scale subsistent farmers due to the necessary costly certification and actually forces the farmers to use pesticides due to the regulations of this organic certification. So organic fair trade isn't always so organic after all. Farmers that can't afford such certification, both financially and due to the integrity of their farming practices, creates a stronger divide in today's world of the neo-colonial notion of us versus them, the first world versus the third world ultimately valuing the wants of the consumer over the needs of our essential producers, and in this case, that's our marginalised spice farmers. Furthermore, looking at India, the rates of suicide among Indian farmers is 2.5 times higher that of the UK's farmers, at around 16.5 thousand committing suicide every year. That's the highest in the world, but it doesn't have to stay this way. My social enterprise, Spice Up Your Life, empowers conscious youth and adults to engage with international spice farmers, just as if they were our locals. Through an app being developed, my business seeks to further solve the issue of young people's struggle to make quick, delicious and nutritious food. So here I invite you to try to taste the difference. In this one we've just got plain couscous with some vegetables that maybe a student might make quickly as a, as a snack, and this one with some spices. Can I ask you a question? Yes, um, there was a, lot, a strong sense of a social purpose. Um, you've clearly got a lot of principle behind what you described in the mm. business. Mm -hmm. is, this, is this a social enterprise? Is it a not-for-profit enterprise? Wait, wait. I don't really understand the social yeah. bit of this. So the social bit is engaging with those marginalised farmers and using their produce over what's currently being used um, to give them that space to, to provide those spices. And through the app, it's a way that builds on the, the individual's consciousness of supporting their livelihoods. So it's multifaceted with the app and it's currently being developed. And so one, one face of that is to help them to understand who is that farmer as if they were your local. I just thought, I don't understand how you're going to make money from it. Yeah. And like, a lot of your focus is on that side there uh, rather than how you're going to make money. And you need the two to make yeah, it work. Yeah. And I'm still not sure yeah. how it actually, because it's... it's, it's Practically, it's quite hard what you're saying to yeah. clients and so from the farmers, and it's not easy, you know. Especially, yeah. it's very competitive too, you know. The supermarkets yeah. are going direct to farmers and all the rest of it. Yeah. For someone to do that, it's great if it works, but I just can't yeah. don't understand that. To be, if I have to be honest. Yeah, I think it's something that um, with growing like 
culture of veganism, for example, going vegetarian, making these switches, businesses are providing solutions that makes it easier to make that switch. And I think this is one way that we're trying to do that by partnering, collaborating with multiple different stores. So um, even just walking to one, it wouldn't have to be just one store <coughs> based in the center, but there would be a few different ones that you'd be able to kind of go to. Um, and I think the switch to refillable is suddenly a little bit of a buzzword um, and people want to support that. And I think when you see that also through the app to see what is the impact actually, um, then it encourages people to, to still be a part of that because you feel part of that process. Um, how will you collaborate with the farmers though? Because yeah. they're, I presume, already dealing with some large companies, manufacturers or yeah. suppliers that they're supplying to, sorry. Yeah. Um, so how are you going to convince them to work with you? Yeah, there are some, uh, or one in particular social enterprise called MCL in, based in Delhi in India, and they work with farmers that pesticide free, don't use chemicals. So it sounds like fair trade is actually not very fair trade. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. a lot of marketing now, yeah. unfortunately, yeah. I mean, and just branding. Have you bought it yourself? Have you bought anything before? Have you actually had something transported over to see where your costs were? Have you done that yet? Myself, Thanks. no, but just from <laughs> relatives bringing it. Otherwise, <laughs> I haven't actually yeah. had to like... That's the key, right? It. Because ultimately, yeah. it's all great what you're doing, but if the costs are too high, no one's going to buy it. And if yeah. you're going to have the same cost, Bottom line is the, the farmer's yeah. not, he's still getting, he's not yeah, benefiting. True, it. Yeah. it looks good on, on, on label, yeah. but the farmer's still being, he's yeah. not fair trade anymore. Yeah, right? there was one place that I found in Brighton, the Spice Shop, that I think also have a store in London, mm -hmm. and they do ba almost similar thing mm -hmm. in that um, they farm from spice farmers who don't have certification for organic. So that was her struggle that she can't label it organic, but it's pesticide free, yeah. which actually in our minds we think what is organic it is chemical free. Aish Sangavi, Veggie Alternatives, Aish app. Veggie Alternatives is a vegan and vegetarian food directory. The app provides users with hundreds of animal-friendly substitutes for a wide selection of different food products. Since release in March last year, the app has reached over 25,000 installs, a Great British Entrepreneur Award nomination, and has been featured across the media, including on BBC, the One Show. Meat-free diets encompass some of the fastest growing markets in the UK. But as these diets and their market value grows exponentially, more and more people become aware of their difficulties. It's incredibly tough to transform your diet and can be complicated even just to maintain one. This is where Veggie Alternatives comes in. In theory, a vegan and vegetarian food directory, the app provides users with hundreds of animal-friendly substitutes for a wide selection of different food products, including chicken, cheese and chocolate. Users can buy products in app and chat with others amongst numerous other features. In essence, Veggie Alternatives is the perfect app for vegans, vegetarians, or even anyone that's just curious about what they eat. There's nothing else quite like it. Since released just under a year ago, the app has reached um, 25,000 downloads, a Great British Entrepreneur Award nomination, and has been featured <coughs> across the media, including on The One Show. These achievements came on a very limited budget, and I've designed, developed, and marketed Veg Alternatives entirely by myself since I first thought of the concept in 2016. My target audience is primarily vegans and vegetarians. However, I also receive large amounts of installs from those who are simply aiming to cut down their meat intake. With campaigns such as Veganuary, demand for meat-free food in the UK increased by 987% in 2017. Typically, younger people are more likely to try out meat-free diets, whilst the vast majority of Veggie Alternatives installs come from Europe, predominantly the UK. Um, other large markets also include North America and Australia. Thank you, Aish. Yeah, Just a question. You talk about getting your user base up to 50k users. Yes. And you talk about um, in-app ads. Yep. What sort of revenue stream do you think you get from 50,000 users? What Roughly. So at 50,000 users from adverts, you can make around um, a month, a few thousand um, a month. And that would just be one of the revenue streams. If you then look at how um, people are buying add-ons, which would also increase with the number of active users, who um, people who are actually buying products through the app, that would also increase with the number of active users. And it would, it would keep going from there. But I think before you, you add any of these, you need to have a stable user base that are coming back to the app and interacting, it, and interacting um, with it at least you know, once a week something like that, um, and then you, you have the stability to implement um, you know, monetization. Can I ask about the, um, the alternatives? Sure. So if I'm becoming vegetarian yes. or vegan, yep. 
I want to understand a substitute for chicken or, mm -hmm. or pork. Once I am an established vegan or vegetarian, why do I need to come back looking for alternatives? That's a good question, but because it's such a like, quick growing market, new products are coming up on the shelves literally every week. Okay. So what I'll, I'll try and do is update it as frequently as I can, keep putting new products on there, tell users about the protein content, the fat content, you know, the cost, and then they can, they can keep changing what they're buying or um, they, they can really decide for themselves, they can weigh up the positives and negatives because the app just sets it out all clearly for them. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it's, it's, it's constantly growing. There are new products, like I, I'm seeing myself, I've, I've got a number of products on there, but then I, if I go to a supermarket and I see something, I'm like, oh, this isn't, this isn't even on the app yet, and it's, and it's hit shelves. So um, yeah, it's just a constantly growing market. Okay. You've got stellar academics, and you've got an offer from Cambridge University to yes. go this year. Yeah. You know, is, this, is this all gonna go to the side when you go to Cambridge? I mean, how committed are you to building this business? I'm, I'm very committed to it. I've, I've been doing it for three and a half years now. I, I started when I was 14, um, and I'm definitely going to try and keep it on the side um, alongside my studies. I've, I've managed up until now, and I, I know obviously it's going to get a lot harder, and I'm going to try and keep it on the side, but I, I definitely agree there are limits to, to how far I can take it and how much time I'll be able to spend on it. Um, but at the moment, I don't have any plans to let it go completely. Even if it that even if I reduce the amount of time that I'm spending on it, even if I have to bring someone in to do some of the work on my behalf, because up until now it's just been me, um, I, I think I'd do that as opposed to letting go of it completely. Okay. Logan Leckie, Mercury. Mercury is an app which combines gamification and a social element to produce a highly interactive educational focus, allowing users to learn the fundamentals of investing. Mercury provides the tools, guidance and resource to upskill users from knowing nothing about investing to creating and managing their own investment portfolio confidently and efficiently. Unfortunately, I'm not, I'm not pitching anything related to the bagpipe, <laughs> uh, but I thought it'd be a good opener. Um, so, over 390,000 young adults graduate from university every year and start their journey into the workforce. Now, during their time at school and university, they would have little, if not no, financial education. So what happens, they enter the workforce, they get their monthly paychecks, and they have no idea how to effectively manage their personal income. So the result is a massive habit of overspending and undersaving. Now my idea is in its early stages, but the one thing um, I've not escaped on, and the one thing I'm pretty proud of, is the amount of research I've done into this problem and this market. So I want to draw on two aspects of that research. The first one is that personally I found it quite surprising of the amount of young professionals who are saving because I interviewed and surveyed quite a lot of them. So quite a lot are, but the savings is incredibly erratic and um, unstructured. So someone might save 10 quid here, 100 quid the next month, then 50, then, then you know, 30 again, um, but very unstructured with no kind of common goal. So what I want to do is provide a tailorized financial planning service to young professionals. Through effective onboarding, I want young professionals to reflect on their long-term life goals. Um, I can see the idea, but I can't quite see the prototype you're talking about. What, what form does that take? What is this prototype? Yeah, so, it, I mean, it's a very basic prototype at the moment. So what I've got is I've got 15 people, and I, we've got a WhatsApp group, and I'm basically interacting with them with a call every week to talk about how their finances are going, how much they're spending, whether they're checking if they're on target. Um, I also know kind of what their objectives are. And I basically set each of these 15 people um, a savings target. Mm -hmm. I think it's a bit conflicted, I have to be honest, because it's hard to do both. And mm -hmm. you mentioned about pairing them to like a DIY type. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, but it's ultimately giving them advice, saying, look, you know, it's a good idea, go to this firm and put your money there. Mm -hmm. And it's got to make money, whatever you're doing. So mm -hmm. you're either going to make money from something that they're putting their money in, or you're charging them to educate from the educational point of view. Yeah. So it's a little bit conflicted. Mm -hmm. um, so you need to be clear yeah. on which way. And ultimately, you've, you've found a problem, but you still haven't found a solution. 
And that's what it's going to boil down to, because mm. you can, with all the goodwill in the world, you can talk about, you know, what they're going to do with their money. But unless you've got a solution, mm -hmm. what are they going to do? Oh, yeah. Where's it going to go? Mm. That's what I still well, haven't, I, I, haven't I, got the solution. I, I, think that, I think you've got a piece there on the education yeah. piece, yeah. you know, investing along the way and the compounding mm. effect that, and look yeah. where it gets you. Mm. That's quite powerful. And probably Definitely. a 20-year-old looking at that would go, bloody hell, yeah. you know, that's... I didn't realise that was the compounding yeah, effect of yeah. starting saving 10 years earlier. Mm -hmm. I mean, well, it also incorporates things like people's behaviours and um, wants and wishes will change. So, for example, they may want to buy a car, mm. um, they may want to buy a house, so then there's a large deposit on a house, or want to get married. Yeah. So, will that advice and app also cater to those ups and downs because there will be investment periods that they want to invest on the house or something. 100% definite. I mean, 100%. I mean, every single person's kind of goals and views are going to change as they kind of grow, grow or kind of get older in life. And it's definitely got to be a system where it adapts and changes and you kind of put in that you want to buy a house and the kind of financial planning system adapts to that and then gives you new goals. As we draw closer to the end of a fantastic year, the judges must make the difficult decision of selecting just one entrepreneur who will walk away with the prize fund of business products and services. Young Startup Talent would like to thank all the judges, sponsors and supporters for their support and look forward to working with the next set of entrepreneurs in 2021. All of those who have made it through the process have the support and business network to make their business a success. We look forward to keeping in contact and update everyone with their progress as they grow and develop their businesses and themselves. To find out more about Young Startup Talent, the sponsors involved, and to follow the progress of entrepreneurs past and present, visit youngstartuptalent.co.uk. My name's Ben Chubb, and I've been the voice of Young Startup Talent for the last three years.